Hey guys, welcome back to my second video in the series of James Hudson joining the X-Men. And in case if you're new to the channel, the whole purpose of this playlist is really to get as much coverage on James Hudson all the way from his first appearance in Ultimate X all the way up till today. So if you're a fan of this guy like myself, when this is all said and done, you have a full list of all the events that he's been through from start all the way until he joins the X-Men blue team. But before we dive into that, I just want to give a quick shout out to our latest Patreon, Kells W. Much thanks Kells, because those contributions allow me to keep videos rolling out regardless of however monetization may go up and down. And I have a link in the description for anybody else who wants to get involved as well. So now picking up right where we left off in the last video, Kitty Pride, James, Rogue, and Iceman just started back on their road trip trying to get to the southwest to the unclaimed territory in hopes of joining whatever mutants that are there still standing and taking out the army of sentinels that are enforcing mutant interrogation and execution. And along their trip every so often they'll have a group of sentinels that are flying through just doing their patrol that they have to duck from because really all it takes is one. If one of these guys spot them they're going to send back for reinforcements and then all the sentinels are just going to come to that spot. And while they were taking cover in this small town they happen to run into Paige Guthrie who had just escaped from one of these small camps nearby. And Paige's first assumption is that Kitty James and the rest of the group had also escaped from a camp. But after talking to Kitty she finds out that this group has crossed the United States looking for the remainder of mutants that have went in hiding. But in further conversation Paige goes on to tell Kitty that other mutants have escaped as well and they've gone in hiding like in military bunkers that are in the desert. So as Paige is leading the group to where the rest of the mutants are she tells Kitty that there's hundreds of them in these underground bunkers. And she told her that she'll take them to the guy who seems like he's in charge. And that guy just happens to be Nick Fury. And Nick lets her know that he has her back 100%. He's been communicating with Captain America behind the scenes giving intel back and forth. And through that intel he was already aware that Kitty, James, and the group were already on their way. And you might wonder like why with this army of mutants down here why Nick Fury hasn't gone out and just taken over these camps. And Kitty even asked Nick why me? Why us? And Nick told her it's because you stepped up. And keep in mind Nick already has the crew sized up before they even got there. He has intel about their little run-ins along the way. And the two that he's most verbal about are James Hudson and Kitty Pride. Like he tells Kitty Pride straight up, I could tell you, I could tell you're the leader. But the cowboy over here looking at James, he's just a sidekick. And that's just one out of a few times that Fury steps on James's toes. Not intentionally, but he's just Fury. That's the way he talks. But in overhearing a conversation between the group, Fury hears James tell Kitty that this isn't your army here. These guys are beat up. They don't have any fight left in them. There's nothing left. But Fury tells James that you're right and you're wrong. He tells him, yes, these guys are beat up. They've been through hell and back. But the real problem is that they lack the hope and inspiration that they can actually win this fight. And so the next day, Kitty takes Paige out to the camp to scout the area and get as much intel as she can. And while they're out there, Kitty's drawing maps of the area, the entrances, exits, just so that when she goes back and makes a plan, she can be as thorough as possible. And while they're on the stakeout, they're having all kind of conversation too. And Paige really doesn't know about what's going on outside of this territory. So Kitty takes the opportunity to catch her up on events that happened in New York. And she tells her how the whole Northeast is shut down. Midwest states like Michigan, Illinois, Minnesota, their status is unconfirmed. Then you have California, Oregon, and Washington who are declared independent. But while they're out here talking, they lost track of time a little bit and another scout of Sentinels comes through. So Paige jumps up and tackles Kitty so she can cover her and camouflage her with the terrain so they're not picked up by the Sentinel scouts. And because of Paige's ability to transform into any type of substance, she's able to camouflage from heat signatures and she tells Kitty that this is the way that she actually escaped. But Paige is still a bit apprehensive about her abilities so she tells Kitty to look the other way as he changes back and it's right here that she inadvertently tells kitty about her little crush on james hudson not knowing about the building chemistry between kitty and james but just asking her to keep a secret as a friend but after the scouts pass over they see a group of jeeps heading towards the camp with dozens of mutants in the back they've already been tied and gagged beaten already before they even get to the camp and this sets kitty y'all because when they get back to the camp she makes an announcement like calling all mutants i need to talk to each and every one of you and fury snatches the radio from her telling that he'll go with her which she agrees to but then james is like what about me and she tells him to stay back because this is something she needs to do herself because she's really trying to prove a point here but James doesn't see it that way her telling him to stay back he takes it extra personal and so as Kitty and Nick go out for the first round of hunting down the Sentinel it's made a little bit clearer why she didn't want James to come along like it was nothing personal but the reason that she did it was because she needed to bring down one of these Sentinels by herself and she also knew that if James would have come that he would have been by her side trying to protect her like even if it was an entire group out there James would have been focused on Kitty and keeping Kitty safe and I know this is a little off subject but I'm not sure if it was conscious decision for Barbara and Medina to illustrate Kitty kind of look like Han Solo right here yeah i'm not sure if it's intentional or not but this particular panel just made me think of han solo let me know what y'all think in the comments but either way she really needed to do this on her own now nick fury is coming for some cover but in her mind she's bringing him along more so to be a witness because if she can bring back the head of one of these nimrods and have nick fury to be there to vouch for her that she actually did it on her own this would inspire and instill hope in dozens of those mutants down there 
who have been persecuted and seen their brothers and sisters slain just for being born the way they are. And Katie Pride is just emptying rounds to jackhammer this thing's head off. And Nick Fury's looking at her like, you are crazy as hell. Cause in this moment, she's like Punisher, Han Solo, and Sarah Connor all wrapped into one. But she gets it done. And she takes that head back to the bunker to show everyone what they're capable of. And Katie's really doing this off of the principle that if you make God bleed, the people will cease to believe in him. And she also makes the point that she achieved this with a couple handicaps. Because they have the home court advantage with this being their land, and she's just a visitor. And on top of that, she achieved this victory without even using her powers and so after her speech the feedback that she gets kind of mixed but one of the muses that comes out from the crowd who's actually wanting to help is garb ed basher otherwise known as garb or just black box and so now he has the mutant ability to communicate with mechanical devices on a telepathic level and also understand complex machinery and if you guys have already seen my james hudson explain video the device that kitty pride gave to james hudson with a message from wolverine actually had a hidden message inside of it that black box is going to uncover later on but as kitty pride is talking here we switch over to the desert probably south of new mexico or something but everything she's saying is being repeated back in like a distorted radio type of frequency and we find out that it's william striker listening in on the conversation through the head of the nimrod that's at the base and when he hears a voice he's like i know that voice new york i know who you are and i don't know if it's just me but the whole concept of somebody's consciousness going inside a machine is just mad creepy so anytime i talk about william striker with anybody man i just get the heebie-jeebies and it reminds me of this old movie called deadly friend at least i think that's the name of it but this girl she's murdered by her abusive father but this kid in the neighborhood like brings her back to life like through some kind of robot and she comes back just murdering everybody man it's, it's crazy i gotta check it out yeah but it's like a late 80s early 90s horror flick man it's, it's back when horror movies had substance but we jump back over here to black box and he's torn down the nimrod head and he's looking for the brain of it which ironically enough is a black box and is like sitting right there like dude come on but as he picks through the parts and does like a process of elimination of what does what he eventually gets around to the black box and it doesn't have any ports it's not making any humming noises no moving parts or anything like that and he notices from a technology standpoint that this piece doesn't really make sense as far as how it connects or functions with any of the other parts because to the naked eye it seems to be inactive but he notices that it's transferring data at real high speed then he figures it out that this piece has been communicating with Striker the whole time. And so at this point, they put together a few different teams to take down Striker's camps. And James Hudson's been made commander of the blue team, in a way kind of foreshadowing him later on joining the X-Men blue team. But this is really the first time that he gets to show his leadership skills. Because with his advanced hearing and his advanced sense of smell, he's able to pick up convoys heading in and out of the camp. That way his team can immobilize them in an isolated area. And the idea of doing it is to take them out without making too much noise so the camp's not alerted, so backup doesn't come either. But it doesn't quite work out that way. Okay. So James radios Fury to do an extraction for the prisoners they picked up. So Fury sets up the extraction, but because of all the noise that they made, the gold team has got to go right away. Because they know reinforcements are going to be coming in pretty soon. And with the intel that Black Box had brought to Kitty, they also know that it's very likely that Striker will be coming himself. And so now with the gold team, which is pretty much Iceman and Page, and from the way it was planned, they really only sent these two, because from what Kitty has scouted, there were only drones and like a few armed men that they would have to go through. And for Iceman and Page, that's not too much for them to handle. But on their way in, Iceman notices two Nimrods heading west, and he gives them the heads up on the radio and Paige tells Bobby that they need to move because their time's limited but right before they go inside the door she tells Bobby to brace himself because what's inside is pretty rough but the one thing I like about these two working together is she can mimic any kind of organic substance so she covers herself in metal and Bobby goes full ice mode which really comes in handy when you're being shot at but aside from these two being capable to resist heavy fire and take out these drones Bobby gets a free little girl who's locked up and seems helpless in her cage but man helpless is the last thing that she is like I don't even know how she got caught because when Bobby lets her out she goes full Genji mode from Overwatch And once she's let out the cage, the fight's pretty much over. Like, her armor deflects all the bullets, and she takes out the soldiers in just one swipe. And then she disarms the turrets. And Bobby and Paige are just looking at her like, oh, oh, well, you're definitely on our team now. And then she formally introduces herself, Hisako Aichiki, otherwise known as Armor, and they show it here. But yeah, you'll notice a lot of these characters from the 1610 have uh, very similar abilities to their counterparts in the 616 universe. But I want to say Black Box was a villain in the main continuity. But I hope all new, all different Marvel finds a way to bring some of these guys back from the 1610. But the camp's been recently liberated and they're gonna start to get help from other mutants as this goes forward like karen grant which is Jean gray she's been in hiding for a while but she shows back up here and this one is only celebrated for a brief time because as soon as william striker is notified that the camp has been liberated he sends a swarm of sentinels to camp 14 with the intent of wiping them out and taking back that checkpoint and fury sees them coming in hot about 20 30 of them and their main objective here really is to stand their ground they liberated the camp already that land is theirs they just have to defend it and keep it but they are fortunate in a way because these nimrods keep coming 
coming in batches because Strike is trying to send however many he can from wherever he can, but they're just coming from the locations that they were at, whether patrolling on a certain route, they're just stopping there and then heading straight to Camp 14. But that force is only going to help them out initially because over time, the amount of rerouted Nimrod is going to be overwhelming. And Kitty has it all planned out as far as who does what when. Like she started out shooting them down from a distance, but as they got closer, she sees fire and send it out the flyers. And that order pretty much put up any mutant in the air that could fly. And the flyers took out quite a few of them, but Nick Fury had to remind Kitty that these are unarmed children that you have out there. Send them in, let them do some damage, and pull them out quick. Because these Nimrods are going to pick up their flight patterns quick and adapt to it. But by the time she gets the order to pull back, it's too late. They've adjusted and they're taking the flyers out left and right. And so at that point, the next call is just for everybody else to engage. However you can, wherever you can. It's just every man tear down a Nimrod. And at that point, you start to see everybody else come out. And if you're probably wondering why they didn't start with some of the stronger mutants like Armor, for instance, really it's two reasons. One, you don't want to start with your big gun in case they adapt to that and then overwhelm you with something else. Two, you want to break them down to as few as possible so your short range fighting mutants don't have as many to worry about because they're your closest line of defense before the fort is taken but at this moment right as they're getting overwhelmed at the doorstep they give the order for their secret weapon which is storm and she just lights up the skies man taking out the last dozen that's left and that ends the battle and fury tells kitty that it's time for him to go he feels confident that she can hold it down here and he has to go back and try to build back up the government and kitty's hesitant at the words new government because she doesn't know if they'll be against or for mutants and fury gives her an honest answer he says he really doesn't know but what he can guarantee that if it comes down to it he'll be back on their side to fight again but when she finds out who the new president is i think she'll be pretty confident that he's on the side of mutants even though he's not a mutant but i'm in this one here guys striker is still inbound with his last batch of nimrod sentinels and his hatred for kitty runs real deep so when he meets him at the base it's gonna be personal but leave your comments below guys let me know what you think about james's journey so far i really wish he had his own series but since he doesn't i'm just piecing together different stuff so it's kind of like he does but hopefully marvel will give him his own depending on how much buzz he gets but be sure to hit that like button below let me know your thoughts in the comments and we'll do it again next time. All right, later.